Section 26 of Why Do We Need a Public Library? This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alethea Why Do We Need a Public Library? By Various Section 26 The Immigrant in the Library By Mary Anton it is very difficult to be interesting or impressive while telling people things that they already know. I won't try to do that. Any one of you sitting in this audience could tell me a great deal more about the immigrant in the library than I can possibly tell you. What I am going to do is to ask you to have in mind what you know about the immigrant, to call up the figure of the immigrant in your libraries as you have seen him daily and test by your knowledge what I have to say. You know better than I do in what numbers the immigrants come to your libraries, how much of their time they spend there, what books they seek there. What I want to ask you is to share your knowledge of these things with as many people as possible. Tell your neighbors every time you have a chance what the immigrant does in the library. Every little while we begin anew the discussion of the immigrant to let him in or not to let him in and all sorts of arguments are presented on both sides representatives of various organizations capitalistic unionistic or what not hurry their advocates to congress to speak for or against on this side and on that side i want to ask you to see to it that the knowledge that you have of the immigrant is also widely spread on such occasions the caricaturist is always ready with his pencil to give us pictures of the immigrant in various amusing poses more or less true more or less false the interesting author of the comic paragraph is always there the artists of the vaudeville stage and enthusiasts of one sort and another enemies or friends of the immigrant are ready to speak up whenever the question comes up you have a fund of knowledge on the subject which is very special very different bring it out on every occasion when the gentlemen in congress want to pass a law to hold up the immigrant at the gate because he cannot read fifty lines of our constitution say to them hold wait and see what the immigrants boys and girls will read when they are let loose in the public library remind them that the ability to read is not in itself a test of intellectuality you know scores hundreds of boys and girls of educated cultured american families who do not take such an interest in your libraries as the boys and girls of these illiterate immigrants you know what you know please tell it so loudly that every one may hear talk about the five-foot shelf of classics is it not true that the boys and girls of the immigrants swallow it whole and make no boast about it why they are saturated with the classics the minute they get a chance the mere ability to read what does that amount to you know what book the immigrant calls for every little while i read a short paragraph in the new york papers telling that the east side branches of the public library have the greatest circulation of the classics i would like to see those little paragraphs enlarged printed big and spread where everybody can see them we need to know these things please let me speak today as an american and not as an immigrant i wish i could efface from your memory this once the knowledge of my origin don't make allowances for what i say because of what i was i am not speaking as an immigrant making an appeal for the immigrants i am speaking to you as an american my credentials are these i have been with you nearly twenty years my father was an americanized citizen before i got here and i married a native american please accept me as an american to-day let me speak as one of yourselves we are so ready to classify people by externals by their habits their customs by the way they dress by their gestures why a better test of a man than the way in which he makes a living is the way in which he spends his leisure and to that you can testify in the case of the immigrant to gain our bread and butter we are forced to do this that and the other thing but nobody drives us into the public library if the saloon is across the way speak up and tell to which door the immigrant turns in his leisure hours 
People of dainty habits are disgusted with the personal habits of the poor foreigners. They have noticed a smell of herring and onions in the east side of New York. The smell of onions, my friends, can be driven out, but a mean habit of mind is harder to eradicate. Many gentlemen who feast daintily on caviar content themselves with the sensational newspaper or the trashy novel. Are they superior to the hired laborers who feast on boiled potatoes and herring and onions and have a volume of the classics propped up before them while they eat? There are people who object to the uncouth manners of the alien. It would do us good to make a study of the natural history of the personal habits of the immigrants. There is a reason for the shrug of the shoulders, for the gestures that are so easily caricatured. They have a history way back that it would do us good to realize. You workers in the libraries, you see the immigrant in hundreds, you see him off guard, for a man in his hours of relaxation is not posing. You see the alien as he is, at least on one side of his nature. Let your neighbors know what you know about the immigrant. Whenever testimony is being taken on the subject, let your voice be as loud as any. Almost every day you will read in your favorite paper letters to the editor about the immigrant peril, how the foreigners lower our standard of life, demoralize our habits, spoil the manners of our children in the public schools. Some of these things are true to a certain extent, but you, under whose observation the immigrant comes and the immigrant's children, ought to be ready with an explanation of many of these things, and you ought to be ready to suggest a remedy. You know what kind of homes these immigrant children come from, and that explains a great deal. You who sit there and agree with me, I can see by your faces. You nod and you smile and you turn to one another, as much as to say, That is so. Don't tell it to me. I know it. Tell it to those who do not know it. A few days ago I received a delegation of boys and girls from the nearest village high school. They represented the debating clubs of their school. They were preparing a debate on the subject of immigration, and who could help them except I? We talked very earnestly for about an hour at my fireside about this perennial question, and these young people took me at my word, and were very much in earnest about what I had to say, and in the way in which they received what I had to say. That is all right. As a subject for discussion in the high schools, that question may be made immortal, but as a subject for national agitation, it ought to be laid at rest. Why is it that certain questions have been settled once and for all, and others are always being reopened? Those questions are settled finally, which are considered in relation to their underlying principles. Let us not confine ourselves to the superficial aspect of the immigration question. Every once in a while, when we come to moralize about these immigrants, there are too many of them, they come from the wrong quarters of the globe, and what not, let us ask ourselves, is that the real thing that concerns us? Or is there something at the bottom of this agitation that ought to receive attention first? Are we really afraid that the immigrant is going to take the bread from our mouths? If so, let us stop and think about it. It is the law of nature that the best man shall come out ahead. Are we going to stop the immigrant by temporarily locking the door while we have possession of the key? It will not be for long. Right to the end it is going to be a struggle between the better and the worse, and the better will get ahead. We need not be afraid that the immigrants will take the bread from our mouths if we see to it that we are equally able or better able than they to earn our bread. It is said they are taking the earth from under our feet. Not if we are strong enough to stand and hold our ground. If they are getting the better of us, it is because they are better than we. Or else, if that is not so, then they cannot be getting the better of us, and we need not be afraid of them. We will never settle this question until we are willing to consider it along fundamental lines. Did our forefathers, when they launched the declaration that all men were created free and equal, refer to the few hundreds or few thousands of people who were then in this country? Why, in that case, many of you are here only as guests. Was there any thought in their minds that of all the people in the world, 
those who happened to get in here before they set to work to compose the Declaration of Independence were the ones who were born free and equal, and with equal opportunities, and all the rest of mankind with limitations? You heartily approved the sentiments expressed in our Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. How, then, can you limit the application of their principles? When did the day dawn when it was time to shut the gate? When did the hour arrive when we could say that all those of free and equal origin were already here, and the rest could stay outside? I don't know at what moment immigrants begin to be immigrants, and not pilgrims and voyagers for spiritual freedom. People were surprised at a phrase I used not long ago, and quoted it right and left, as if I had made a great discovery, when I said that every ship that brings over the immigrants is another Mayflower. Why, I cannot think of it in any other terms. Ships are now made to run with steam instead of with sails, and our forefathers did not come in the steerage, because the Mayflower wasn't built that way. You see, I am not sticking to my text, a proof of an inexperienced speaker. But I am not a speaker. I am a witness on the witness stand. I have been called from the ranks to testify. Now each of you is in the same position. It would have been an impertinence on my part to get up before a body of scholars without a finished address, if I had any idea that I was going to make an intellectual contribution. I simply answer to my name as a witness, and each of you can do no less. Testify to what you know. Now remember, I am not asking this for the sake of the immigrant. If this were the proper time and place, I would tell you just how, in what order, my interest in the immigrant on the one hand and in America on the other developed. With me, it was America first, and it still is so. I was not conscious of the immigrant as a special class of our citizenship until I became conscious of certain American problems. It is with me the immigrant for the sake of America, not America for the sake of the immigrant, and I beg you to believe me. And why do I insist that all the truth you know about the immigrant shall be brought out? I am not speaking, I cannot repeat it emphatically enough, because I am an immigrant. Not even because I represent that specially large group of immigrants, the Jews. If America should go back on its ancient traditions and close its hospitable doors, the Jews would suffer bitterly. But what is one more disappointment in the history of the Jews? They have known how to lift up their hearts and thank God for disappointments before. They would simply adopt another dream. It is not for them that I speak. Nor is it because I am a great lover of justice. I want to see that justice is done to the stranger, to be sure. Let us know all sides of the immigrant that no injustice may be done. But the thing that makes me speak to you more than any other is my love for America, for the ideals that I was taught to cherish in the public school. I took everything in my school books literally. When I read that this is the land of freedom, that the door is open to all worthy men and women, and that all shall have an equal opportunity, I want to hold you to that, to a literal interpretation of those terms. I went back to Russia two years ago, to Polotsk on the Dvina, the city in Nepal where I was born, and again I felt as I felt in the beginning, when I first came here, after seeing how those people over there regard us. They still take us at our word. When we turn them away at the gate, for this and that petty excuse at the bottom of which is some selfish motive that we do not dare to acknowledge, they are bitterly disappointed. And yet they are not the worst sufferers. It is we who suffer, we as Americans, for in turning them away we abandon our ideals and lose the consciousness that we are still conserving the ideals of our forefathers. It always seems to me that in our attitude towards the immigrant, more than in any other branch of our national policy, we make manifest our true ideals. In our formal dealings with foreign governments, we may make blunders, we may betray weaknesses, but on the whole, these matters remain a secret with the foreign ambassador. The people at large do not follow very closely these dignified negotiations about treaties and tariff and what not. But as we meet these individual men and women at the gate, here we give ourselves away. 
there at the gate of entrance we the people of america deal directly with the people of the world the immigrant with his million eyes is looking at us and he will tell whether or not we still believe in the things for which we honor our forefathers on all our patriotic anniversaries there was a young jewish girl working in my household as a cook who had been through very unhappy experiences in this country experiences which unfortunately have been multiplied in the lives of many other girls who come here unprotected she told me her story once and i saw that what hurt her more than her own misfortunes more than the agony she had been through more than the disgrace she had suffered was her disappointment in america she found that in america in this instance that she knew of in her own life a man may do a gross wrong and there is no way to get hold of him and punish him she had times of discouragement when she would talk to me and complain of that thing oh it shook me to find that in the mind of this ignorant illiterate child of seventeen we the american people had lost something of our prestige i talked to her perhaps the need inspired me and explained to her that our laws like the laws of civilization at large are not yet perfect that law and civilization are things of gradual growth and showed her that although we are still to blame for many things that here exist we have done far better than other people in some respects i made it my business to try to prove to this ignorant russian girl my cook who waited on me every day that america was still america despite some mistakes and some failings and that on the whole we have gone further in the quest of justice than other nations it mattered to me that this one girl should think we are still americans and surely it matters to you just as much do not let these millions that come to our gates get the wrong impression of us do not let people with selfish interests to serve who send representatives to congress speak louder than you do when this question comes to be discussed let the truth out every time for the sake of our country i am asking it not for the sake of the unfortunate foreigners we owe them something as a people of charitable heart to be sure but we owe more to ourselves and to our traditions the same girl of whom i speak also afforded an illustration of some of the nobler traits of many of our immigrants that you are aware of and that you ought to testify to i mean the reverence for learning that is found among the ignorant the illiterate of many of our immigrants this girl who could not read or write a word in any language until she came to me when gradually by means of the cookbook she made some progress had a genuine reverence for learning which is in itself half the material for making a scholar i kept her pretty busy in my household as i usually do keep our maids and sometimes when there would be a rush of more work than i could do i would put her to extra trouble to bring my luncheon upstairs perhaps when i could not stop for meals oh miss anton she used to say it is wonderful that i can wait on somebody who can write books a respect for letters such as this is not one of our prominent characteristics as americans i ought to have the courage of our foreign visitor who told the truth about his people i can do no less we cannot boast of too much reverence for learning is it not a great asset these foreigners bring with them this reverence for learning the man behind the pushcart can't read fifty lines of the constitution but his heart bows in reverence before the man who can and that is worth more than the ability to read the constitution and forget it there are so many ways of classifying the immigrants as laborers as a peril as a help according to one's point of view but i always think of them as a cloud of witnesses in the tribunal of the nations they go back and forth in person or through letters their experience is reported all over the world and they tell the truth about us the immigrant is the only visitor you know who comes to stay and finds us out the tourists the critics the honorable guests of various honorable institutions who are taken around in carriages and shown our best front what do they know about us the letters home that go out from the east side shiploads of letters some of them written at dictation sent by persons who cannot write themselves i used to write letters for my cook i have never forgotten some of them 
those are the documents that go all over the world they are forming their opinion of us in the far corners of the earth what shall they say of us if you see that justice is done in the case of the immigrant they will have no evil to say of us our traditions of liberty of hospitality to the oppressed will be realized in the eyes of the world now it does not matter that the immigrants today may not be running away from religious oppression or may not be victims of political martyrdom martyrdom of the worst kind is martyrdom of the spirit and immigrants who have suffered such martyrdom are still coming to us by the shipload it is accurate to say in a certain way that the immigrants in the beginning came in search of liberty and today they come in search of bread that may all be but with most of our present-day immigrants if you give them bread and nothing else they are not satisfied you know it and i know what the people said in polotsk only two years ago if any of you thought from reading my story that i had put down the reminiscences of my early childhood with the haze of the past over all that i had idealized everything in my enthusiasm i can assure you that while my story was in manuscript i went back to polotsk to find out if i had told the truth and i found that i had i found there my old rabbi my teacher who taught me my hebrew letters i talked with various of the old scholars who were very old when i got back after seventeen years absence these old men who spend their time over the talmud in the corridors of the synagogues and i found among them just that attitude toward america which i remembered to have existed when i came away nearly twenty years ago they look on us to-day as on the upholders of justice and true liberty they still believe in us do not let them lose that faith it is more to us than it is to them that they shall be satisfied in their high longings that is all i ask of you you know the immigrant as he is in the library you have a view of him that most people have not you send your little paragraphs to the new york papers they are not printed big enough nobody sees them speak up and tell what you know about the immigrant that justice may be done that we may remain sound-headed and true-hearted in our national life true to our traditions and the immigrant will hear with a million ears and see with a million eyes and run with a million feet to the far corners of the earth to cry that america is still america the first vice president i shall ask you to rise as an expression of thanks and appreciation of miss anton's address the audience remained standing for a moment the next speaker will discuss the subject of immigrants as contributors to library progress it gives me very great pleasure to introduce to you mrs adelaide b maltby who is in charge of the tompkins square branch on the lower east side of the new york public library end of section twenty six recording by alethea Section 27 of Why Do We Need a Public Library by Various. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Section 27 of Why Do We Need a Public Library by Various. On the supply of printed books from the library to the reading room of the british museum by anthony panizzi Quote, the requisition to insert the titles and press marks on the tickets is not merely reasonable but it is indispensable if the library is to be conducted with satisfaction to the public and to the librarians if people will not take the trouble to comply with rules which so far from being vexatious are absolutely necessary for their own comfort they have no right to complain the fault is theirs if mistakes and delay arise and it is as absurd as unjust to impute the effect of their own ignorance or carelessness to the officers of the museum sir nicholas harris nicholas 
eighteen thirty six the publication of the annexed correspondence has been determined upon not for the pleasure of exposing the mistakes and inconsistencies of sir nicholas harris nicholas but for the purpose of drawing the attention of those who take an interest in the collection of printed books in the british museum to a most important part of its management viz the supply of books to readers in order to make the correspondence intelligible it will be necessary to explain not only the circumstances which gave rise to it but also the system of arrangement adopted to secure a regular attendance upon the readers from the library as well as the reasons why this system has been suggested and it is hoped that when the whole system is carefully examined it will not be found undeserving of that support without which it is impossible that any scheme can be carried out at the risk of entering into minute and very uninteresting particulars well known to those who are conversant with the arrangements of a large library it is requisite to state that the books in that of the british museum are found by certain references press marks or symbols by which each work is identified with the corresponding entry of its title in the catalogue the title of a work marked in the catalogue with for instance five hundred a means that the work itself is in the press which is numbered five hundred and on the shelf of that press which is distinguished by letter a if the mark b five hundred a two the meaning is that the work occupies the second place on that shelf and if marked five hundred a slash six two that it is the sixth article in the second volume on shelf a of press five hundred a book being wanted the shortest way by far is generally found to be and in the greatest number of cases it is the only one to search the catalogue find the press mark and look for the book accordingly in eighteen thirty six at my suggestion an alteration in the then prevailing system was adopted which the committee of the house of commons on the british museum then sitting considered an improvement and so it was universally pronounced to be the question put to me on the subject by lord stanley as well as my answer are here inserted Quote, will you state what improvement has been recently adopted in the new transcript of the catalogue with regard to reference Unquote. Quote, in the catalogue of the british museum the one which we keep for the use of the library there are certain references given or symbols to know exactly where to find a book in the reading-room catalogue those symbols were not put i thought and mr baber thought also that it would be an evident improvement to have in the catalogue for the reading-room the same references as in the catalogue of the library because the reader would have only to copy the title of the book as well as the references and instead of his ticket going to one of our men who is obliged to look over the catalogue inside to put the reference the attendant would go direct with that ticket to the place where the book is and carry it to the reading-room immediately it would be an economy of time for the readers consequently an economy of time for our men and consequently a saving of expense in the number of men but there are other advantages attending this system often the readers come to ask for a book which was never printed or which if printed is not in the library or they write down the title as they have seen it elsewhere not correctly quoted and give it to one of the attendants the attendant begins to look over all the catalogues and cannot find the book he is afraid of being in the wrong he loses a great deal of time and the consequence is that all the readers who have written correct tickets are kept waiting by the fault of him who has written an incorrect one by the new system a person will be obliged to look in the catalogue in order to put down the reference 
he will therefore ascertain whether we have the book or not and not give us useless trouble and to the injury of other readers having given that reference if it be wrong it may be wrong because it is incorrectly put and then we must answer for it but if it be the fault of the reader although i could find the book i would on principle return the ticket because all the other readers are inconvenienced by the carelessness of this one and the returning the ticket would be the best mode of ensuring attention by this means we shall save much time and remove much of the inconvenience now complained of by the readers unquote. it was found however that some readers who neglected to comply with these rules hindered the ready supply of books to those who did comply with them and when in eighteen thirty seven i succeeded mr baver as keeper of the printed books department i thought of suggesting printed tickets or formulae according to which books were to be asked for by merely filling them up the following is an exact specimen of these tickets press mark title of work wanted size place date date and signature please to restore each volume of the catalogue to its place as soon as done with on the reverse it is as follows readers are particularly requested one not to ask for more than one work on the same ticket two to transcribe literally from the catalogues the title of the work wanted three to write in a plain clear hand in order to avoid delay and mistakes four before leaving the room to return the books to an attendant and to obtain the corresponding ticket the reader being responsible for the books so long as the ticket remains uncancelled readers are under no circumstances to take any book or manuscript out of the reading rooms can anyone say that to request readers to fill up such a form correctly and to comply with these rules is giving unnecessary trouble my suggestion was approved of by sir h ellis under whose especial control the management of the reading room is placed and who moreover proposed that the same system should be adopted for manuscripts which was done accordingly with the concurrence of sir f madden and the sanction of the trustees it has continued in operation ever since for both departments but no attack has been made upon any one but myself for this scheme the improvement was all but unanimously acknowledged to be very great and no one rendered more justice to its merits to the motives which led to its adoption and to its beneficial results than sir n harris nicholas who having heard that a reader had expressed some dis satisfaction addressed to me the following letter quote, torrington square twentieth october eighteen thirty seven my dear sir having heard to-day with great surprise that a reader of the library of the british museum had expressed dissatisfaction at the new regulations which you have introduced for obtaining books i take the liberty of offering you the opinion of a person who has constantly used the library for sixteen years and who perhaps is not very likely to be suspected of bestowing indiscriminate or venal praise the great object of a public library is despatch in procuring books this can only be secured by perspicuity in describing them in my humble judgment no better mode could possibly be devised for immediately obtaining any particular work than the printed tickets you have suggested by specifying the titles from the catalogue and copying from it the press marks the applicant can at once identify the particular edition or copy of an edition which he requires the importance of this to a critical student is obvious and i cannot shew the utility of the new system more forcibly than by saying that i have often 
formerly been assured that a book was not in the museum though i had myself referred to it only a few days before the requisition to insert the titles and press marks on the tickets is not merely reasonable but it is indispensable if the library is to be conducted with satisfaction to the public and to the librarians if people will not take the trouble to comply with rules which so far from being vexatious are absolutely necessary for their own comfort they can have no right to complain the fault is theirs if mistakes or delay ensue and it is as absurd as unjust to impute the effect of their own ignorance or carelessness to the officers of the museum the only thing i can suggest about the new tickets is that the press marks should be made more simple but this is so manifest and is so entirely dependent upon the rearrangement of the library that it would be ridiculous to say another word on the subject as to dispatch in procuring books not only does my own experience convince me of the great improvements which have taken place since your last appointment but such is the opinion of every one whom i have heard speak of the museum and i have long had daily opportunities of witnessing your courtesy and earnest desire to render your department as beneficial as possible to the public to point out a defect or to suggest an improvement is to secure your attention and as a matter of common justice i anxiously bear testimony to the change which has taken place since your promotion you have done wonders in a few weeks and i pray you not to allow the caprice or folly of individuals to affect your exertions believe me with great esteem my dear sir very sincerely yours etc Unquote. this letter stated almost all that could be said in favour of the plan it seemed to express opinions maturely considered i was therefore unprepared to hear condemned as unnecessary and vexatious see number ten what had been pronounced by the same writer as not only not vexatious but absolutely necessary the plea that quote, he usually writes and speaks from the impression of the moment unquote, may as easily be alleged in defence of his present as of his former judgment and lead people to trust neither but although the letter sets forth what can be said in favour of the plan which it praises it touches but slightly on those hindrances which carelessness or malice can alike produce to defeat its success any person who from either cause gives wrong references who writes illegibly who misdescribes a book who misspells the name of an author who asks for a large number of books at the same moment who will not take the trouble to deliver his tickets to the proper person but leaves them about to be lost or mislaid who has recourse to the pettiest devices to create a grievance for the purpose of complaining of it such a person will certainly be kept occasionally waiting and how can it be otherwise yet these are the very persons who complain most avoiding however investigation when they would be proved wrong and writing anonymously to newspapers stating truly it may be the fact of having been kept waiting but taking good care to render it impossible to prove that it was by their fault this is not all the endeavours made to correct their mistakes and to decipher their handwriting take much time and the delay is not unfrequently turned against the officers and servants of the museum who are actually found fault with for doing more than they are bound to do meanwhile readers who have done all that is required of them are probably kept waiting and though they may submit in silence to the inconvenience they cannot help feeling dissatisfied with what seem to be defects in the management of the library the justice of the complaint which gave rise to the following correspondence will have been rendered more intelligible by this preliminary information 
the facts are as follows on the eighteenth of may sir n h nicholas asked for five works at once four out of five of these works were brought to him within half an hour as he himself states and on the supposition that he in his first letter had complained of delay i in answer number two expressed my regret at the occurrence in letter number three sir nicholas says i did not make any complaint respecting the four books because i am so accustomed to such a delay that i consider it a matter of course though certainly not one of necessity i quote this passage as it affords the most conclusive proof of the despatch in obtaining books in the reading-rooms of the british museum and of the unreasonableness of such readers as sir n h nicholas i assert without fear of contradiction that in none of the great public libraries in the world equal in extent to that of the british museum is one single reader supplied with four out of five works which he asked for at once at the rate of seven minutes and a half each work nor even in double that time the very fact that sir in harris nicholas considers such a delay a matter not of necessity proves to what he is reduced for want of solid ground of complaint i expressed a regret for which there was no occasion for peace's sake and because the moment i got sir in h nicholas's first letter i suspected that an article against the museum library in the spectator of the day before being his his letter was only a peg for a querelle d'allemande which i should have been most glad to avoid with these feelings i wrote letter number two there are in the old printed and useful catalogue from which sir n h nicholas took what he wrote on his ticket three distinct works by the same author the entries of which are as follows Burchard, josiah memoirs of transactions at sea during the war with france beginning in sixteen eighty eight and ending sixteen ninety seven london seventeen o three eight o six b slash two mr burchett's justification on his naval memoirs in answer to reflections made by colonel livingston or that part which relates to cape francois and port de paix eight london seventeen o four five eighty one i a complete history of the most remarkable transactions at sea from the earliest accounts of time to the conclusion of the war with france folio london seventeen twenty it appears from sir n h nicholas's first letter that the work he wanted was the last and had he given a ticket somewhat as follows there is no doubt he would have got the book in five minutes pressmark five eighty one title of the work wanted burchette josiah a complete history of the most remarkable transactions at sea etc size folio place london date seventeen twenty date may eighteenth eighteen forty six n harris nicholas signature please to restore each volume of the catalogue to its place as soon as done with instead of this he gave a ticket of which the following is a facsimile illustration now the attention of those who take an interest in this matter is particularly requested to the following details every one of them trifling indeed and yet all springing from the ticket which was given and more than enough to show the consequences which followed from the carelessness of its writer after having sent into the reading-room four out of the five books asked for by sir n h nicholas which as he states took half an hour and therefore as nearly as possible at half-past three the same attendant went in search of the fifth marked five eighty one i he found that five eighty one i contained only folios and he did not therefore and very properly lose more of his time in looking for an octavo which was written for he had lost enough by being sent to a place where what was wanted could not be 
in justice to the other readers as well as to the department the ticket ought to have been at once returned to sir n h nicholas marked wrong in order that he might have corrected his own mistakes if a reader's mistakes are to be corrected by the attendants all the evils arising from the old system as described in my evidence before the house of commons are increased for in addition to the loss of time in finding what a reader wants there is the previous and additional loss caused by the error of the applicant in directing an attendant to look for a work where it could not be this loss of time proves injurious chiefly to the other readers and it is quote, for their own comfort unquote, that readers are requested to comply with the rules without causing an attendant to waste the public time to discover what an individual applicant may want which no one can know so well as the applicant himself the attendant however being newly appointed and being anxious to serve sir n h nicholas set about trying to find what was wanted the first difficulty which presented itself was to make out the ticket so badly written as almost to defy the eye of a man unaccustomed to the hand a consultation was held with another attendant and thus the loss of time of another man added to the former and the name virtue being made out the catalogue was referred to and the three entries found as already transcribed the ticket let it be remembered contained only the words Birchett's history of transactions at sea eight octavo fever seventeen o four without saying for what period the first of the three entries began with the words memoirs of transactions at sea and related to an eight v o printed at london in seventeen o three memoirs and history are not the same words yet as a mistake had occurred might this not be the book the date seventeen o three being so near to seventeen o four the second entry was to be sure of an eight v o printed at london in seventeen o four but then it was not a history of transactions at sea the third entry besides being a history not of transactions at sea like the memoirs but only of the most remarkable ones was a folio not an info and printed in seventeen twenty not seventeen o four it stood however in five eight one i in doubt which was the book wanted the attendant not unnaturally supposed it might be the first but then the entry had no press mark which could enable him to ascertain the fact by looking at the book itself this led him to make a third attendant likewise lose some time to examine into the circumstances who knowing more of the library having been longer in it perceived that this entry was unmarked because the volume to which it referred had been sold as duplicate of one in the royal library where the preserved copy would be found the first attendant then transferred the ticket to a fourth well acquainted with the royal collection and this fourth attendant after all proper inquiries came to the correct conclusion that the memoirs were not wanted but as he could not say which work was he returned the ticket to the attendant from whom he had received it now there was yet a chance of making out the meaning of the writer of that ticket and that was to examine the identical copy of the volume of the catalogue kept in the reading-room from which the ticket ought to have been copied and to see whether all this trouble was caused by an error in it which might have misled sir n h nicholas to ascertain this the attendant went to examine that volume but with no better result and he was still unable to discover where the error lay whilst all this was going on sir n h nicholas complained once and only once to scott the attendant who did not tell him that he had corrected a wrong press mark given for the book as stated nor that quote, he had often applied for it unquote. to mr brabham and to scott sir n h nicholas pointed out in the catalogue the book he wanted 
scott went into the library found the attendant assisted by another still endeavoring to discover the book and on the entry being pointed out by scott as it had been to him by sir nicholas the attendant went with the catalogue in his hand to show to this gentleman whence the delay arose and to express his great sorrow that sir nicholas should have been kept waiting he moreover told sir nicholas that he should now have the book in five minutes sir n h nicholas did not however seem satisfied and allowed the attendant to have the additional trouble of finding the book in a hurry yet as soon as he had heard that it would be forthcoming in five minutes sir nicholas left the room without waiting the few minutes requisite to find it and went away most fortunately leaving behind him a ticket which enables me to show the real state of the case and he complains of having been kept waiting an hour and a half for one book the fact is he was kept waiting one hour for during the first half hour he had got four other books and who can wonder at it and who has more right to complain the reader of the officers or the officers of the reader the only reader who had a right to complain but who did not although he considered the delay unusual was mr ferold who wanted to look at a work merely to correct a proof sheet which he had brought with him and who had asked for it very correctly but who could not obtain it for more than half an hour whilst the time of six persons was more or less wasted on sir in harris nicholas who complains of the attendant after not only a good explanation but a respectful apology and who moreover ventures to assert in his correspondence see letter number ten that i justify the attendant quote, in refusing the book unquote. whereas nothing can be clearer than that the attendants one and all far from refusing any book did all they could and more than they were bound to find it and that sir nicholas was fully aware of this when he wrote that letter if any one among those who act under my direction fails in his duty i never shall hesitate in taking proper notice of it but i will never allow any of them whatever be his station to be unjustly accused without defending him when i answered sir n harris nicholas's first letter i very briefly stated only such facts as proved the injustice of his accusation without giving any opinion whatever the reasons for my moderation have been given this moderation did not avail me much sir n h nicholas was not only dissatisfied with my letter but in his reply number three he shifted his ground and complained of quote, the difficulties and delay arising from the present regulations and the state of the catalogues unquote. if the difficulties and delay arise from the regulations then his complaint of neglect against the attendant was a most ungenerous proceeding and if he thought this complaint well grounded he would not complain of the system as he talked of the attention of the trustees being called to the subject i begged of him number four and five to prove what he had asserted the truth of the habitual delay and its cause he declined the offer which a man convinced of the veracity of his statements would have willingly accepted and wrote in a much lower tone number six i again called on him to specify his charges number seven and told him that his unfavorable opinions must be quote, of a recent date unquote. he denied this carefully avoiding entering into any particulars but went on with the generalities number eight except as to quote, press marks etc unquote, which he declared to be the source of delay in answer to this recent accusation i employed the very arguments and words which he himself had long before used in praise of this very system and arrangement number nine his own words and arguments made him still more dissatisfied and he vehemently condemned them number ten upon which i sent him enclosed in 
number eleven a copy of his own letter of the twentieth of october eighteen thirty seven and as he had been taunting me with what he had printed and meant to print against me i called on him to print along with it this letter this he declined to do number twelve though in the spectator of the thirtieth of may he continued his attacks not without some awkwardness however now that he knew the proof i had of what he had so indignantly denied the recent date of his unfavorable opinions in the course of the correspondence sir n h nicholas endeavored to drag me into a controversy about catalogues and a variety of other points connected with the library i did not feel disposed to enter into a profitless discussion with such an adversary in the spectator too he has indulged in making assertions and passing sentence on every thing which he assumes that i have ever done or now do i shall not defend myself except before a competent judge whenever an inquiry which i have courted letters number four and five and still court and from which sir nicholas harris nicholas has shrunk and will shrink shall take place either before the trustees or before any higher authority whatever i will provide what i stated in my letter number eleven that no reliance can be placed on his opinions and assertions i shall take no further notice either of anything that sir in harris nicholas may say or of any anonymous attack whatsoever a panizzi british museum june fifth eighteen forty six end of section twenty seven section twenty eight of why do we need a public library by various this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt Perard. section twenty eight of why do we need a public library by various correspondence between sir nicholas h nicholas and mr panizzi number one sir n h nicholas to mr panese torrington square eighteenth may eighteen forty six my dear sir i beg leave to acquaint you with what occurred to me to-day in the reading-room of the british museum thinking it a proper subject of complaint at a few minutes after three o'clock i wrote according to the present forms or five books after half an hour four of them were brought me the fifth viz burchett's complete history of transactions at sea not having appeared i spoke twice to mr scott who assured me that he had often applied for it and that on his last application he was told that i was given a wrong press mark which he had corrected i denied that i had given a wrong press mark at half past four i again asked for the book and a strong observation having caused the gentleman who succeeded mr pates to attend to the matter he ascertained that i had given both the title and the press mark correctly a person then came to me from the library his first excuse was that though the press mark and the title were correctly given i had erroneously quoted the date that was true but i submit that when a press mark and a title are correctly stated the book ought to be forthcoming or at all events that some explanation should be afforded before an hour and a half i told him so and his excuse then was that he had only had my ticket half an hour and that he had sent me four books how far this may be a justification it is for you to judge and i leave the facts without comment for your consideration i remain etc i ought to add that the person's manner was not disrespectful number two mr panizzi to sir n h nicholas british museum may nineteenth eighteen forty six my dear sir 
i hasten to answer your letter of yesterday's date which i have this moment received with reference to the delay of which you complain in the delivery of four out of five of the works you ask it is now impossible for me to find on whom the fault rests had you informed me of the delay at the moment i might have been more successful the attendant who sent those four works to the reading room has not been here long and may therefore have been less prompt in finding them than a more experienced hand might have been and i regret it as to the fifth book it appears from your letter that you required a folio printed at london in seventeen twenty you have however given on the ticket the size of eight vo the place as f b r which may be is meant for london and the date seventeen o four there is in the catalogue a work of virgin different from the one you wanted and immediately preceding it eight vo london seventeen o four you mistook this part of the entry of what you did not want and applied it to what you did should you not deem this answer satisfactory i will thank you by your informing me of it that i may lay your complaint before the trustees believe me etc number three sir n h nicholas to mr panisi torrington square eighteenth may eighteen forty six my dear sir in reply to your letter i beg leave to say that your explanation is wholly unsatisfactory to me i did not make any complaint respecting the four books because i am so accustomed to such a delay that i consider it a matter of course though certainly not one of necessity with respect to the fifth book i am of opinion that the title only ought to be as it would have been in the time of your predecessors sufficient i did however give and correctly the press mark and there is no other book in the english language with that title it is idle to pretend that because a mistake was made as to its size and date which in the instance of a work of which there is only one edition cannot be necessary and ought not to be required there was any difficulty in finding the volume if there had really been any doubt as to the work i required why was not the question asked me or both books brought whereas no notice whatever was taken of my application for an hour and a half and then only because i insisted upon its being attended to you seem to think that i should have informed you of the delay in bringing the four books i rejoice that i did not waste my time in such a manner for now when i do complain of a flagrant act of neglect you think fit to justify it by imputing it to myself in not having given correctly that which ought not to be required my next complaint shall be to the trustees themselves i pray of you to use your own discretion about submitting this correspondence to the trustees it is the less material to me whether you do or do not do so inasmuch as i am perfectly sure that their attention must very shortly be called by the public or by the government to the difficulties and delay arising from the present regulations and the state of the catalogues in obtaining printed books believe me etc number four mr panizzi to sir n h nicholas may twentieth eighteen forty six my dear sir your letter of the nineteenth as well as my answer and your reply of yesterday shall be laid before the trustees no one will rejoice more than myself at a thorough investigation of any part of my conduct brought on by avowed and specific complaints in an open and straightforward manner believe me etc number five the same to the same may twenty second eighteen forty six my dear sir the trustees meet to-morrow saturday may twenty third at one o'clock p m our correspondence shall be submitted to them simply with a request on my part that they be pleased to inquire into all the circumstances to which 
it refers i shall consider it a favour if you will bring before them all the charges you have to make against me and be ready to substantiate them believe me etc number six sir n h nicholas to mr panese torrington square may twenty second eighteen forty six my dear sir when my letters to you including if you please the present one are submitted to the trustees they will learn that in my opinion a great change is necessary in the regulations of the reading-room and i beg leave to assure you that i am perfectly ready to avow and maintain to the trustees everything which i may have at any time or in any place said or written on the subject should they think proper to ask me to do so it may assuredly be permitted to me as one of the public to complain to the head of any department of neglect in that department and even to consider as i most certainly do with respect to yours that many of its proceedings however well intended are detrimental to the public and require to be altered without being told that i am bringing charges against you which i am invited to substantiate as if i were accusing you of misconduct believe me etc number seven mr panese to sir n h nicholas may twenty third eighteen forty six my dear sir notwithstanding the concluding part of your letter of yesterday which shall be submitted to the trustees with the rest of our correspondence i think that to find fault with my department implies a charge against myself still more so as in your second letter you began by declaring that my first was wholly unsatisfactory that in the time of my predecessors things were better managed by their requiring only the title of the books wanted by readers and no press mark that your next complaint should be to the trustees themselves and concluded by stating that their attention must shortly be called by the public or by government to the difficulties and delay arising from the present regulations and state of the catalogues in obtaining printed books these are certainly charges and i naturally expected you would do me the favour to bring them before the trustees so that i might have an opportunity of proving them groundless i am glad that you now give me credit for good intentions but as you still consider that many of my proceedings are detrimental to the public and require to be altered i shall feel obliged by your informing me what are the proceedings to which you allude i presume that your unfavourable opinion of them is of a recent date believe me etc number eight sir n h nicholas to mr panese torrington square twenty four may eighteen forty six my dear sir i am favoured with your letter of yesterday as you have referred our correspondence to the trustees and as my letters advert to those arrangements in your department which i consider detrimental to the public it is possible that i may be requested by the trustees to state my objections more fully when you will have an opportunity of answering them if however the trustees do not do so you may be assured that you shall have ample information on the subject to enter into a personal discussion with a gentleman who is so perfectly satisfied of the propriety of his own measures as to invite it only that he may prove my objections to them groundless and who when complained to of a flagrant act of neglect in his department thought proper to justify it would manifestly be an utter waste of time there must be an appeal to a higher authority and which is the more necessary because you may not be answerable for all though you certainly are for much of what seems to be improper in your department you are mistaken in supposing that my unfavourable opinion on those points is of a recent date my sentiments respecting press marks etc have long been entertained and expressed i have also long thought that the delay in completing the catalogue was unjustifiable 
but not having carefully examined its plan until a few weeks ago or been acquainted with your last reports i was not aware of its imperfections until lately it is candid to acquaint you that the opinions which i entertain about press marks and the delay in obtaining printed books are shared by every literary man to whom i have spoken that no one can account for the delay in completing the catalogue and that none approve of its plan the general feeling appears to be similar to my own namely that the effect of the system you have introduced is to keep all the working part of literary men out of the library until they are actually compelled to refer to it you must admit that this question is one of deep interest to literature and as i do not imagine that you desire or intend to produce such results i may without any personal offence presume to think that you have made some serious mistakes believe me etc number nine mr panizzi to sir n h nicholas british museum may twenty fifth eighteen forty six my dear sir i have to acknowledge your letter of yesterday and as do what i may i cannot prevail upon you to reduce to a definite and tangible shape the vague and serious charges which you have volunteered against me i must have patience and wait till you bring them before the higher authority of which you speak when as you foresee i may show that i am not answerable for all though you with characteristic fairness have begun by supposing that i was the only one of your charges about which you venture to come to something like particulars that relating to the press marks etc i cannot avoid showing to be utterly groundless and i am confident that you will agree with me in spite of your unfavourable opinion which i persist in thinking of a recent date the great object of a public library is dispatch in procuring books this can only be secured by perspicuity in describing them in my humble judgment no better mode could possibly be devised for obtaining any particular work than the printed tickets which i suggested in eighteen thirty seven and which are now in use by specifying the titles from the catalogue and copying from it the press marks the applicant can at once identify the particular edition or copy of an edition which he requires the importance of this to a critical student is obvious and i cannot show the utility of the new system more forcibly than by appealing to your own experience which will bear me out in saying that readers have often before the introduction of those tickets been assured that a book was not in the museum though they had themselves referred to it only a few days before the requisition to insert the titles and press marks on the tickets is not merely reasonable but it is indispensable if the library is to be conducted with satisfaction to the public and to the librarians if people will not take the trouble to comply with rules which so far from being vexatious are absolutely necessary for their own comfort they can have no right to complain the fault is theirs if mistakes or delay ensue and it is as absurd as it is unjust to impute the effect of their own ignorance or carelessness to the officers of the museum i thank you for your candor in acquainting me that the opinion which you entertain about press marks and the delay in obtaining printed books is shared by every literary man to whom you have spoken to be as candid with you i beg to say that the experience of every one who has been heard speak at the museum has convinced him of the great improvements which have taken place since my last appointment i now beg that you will do me the favour to give me your authority for your assertion i shall be most happy to give you mine for one so directly at variance with yours i am etc number ten sir m h nicholas to mr panizzi torrington square twenty sixth may eighteen forty six my dear sir the sooner a correspondence with a gentleman who will not understand what would be perfectly intelligible to everybody else 
who perverts the obvious meaning of courteous expressions who affects to disbelieve a distinct assurance and who ventures to accuse another of unfairness adding that it is characteristic is concluded the better all which i have yet said of your proceedings as keeper of the printed books is as i have no doubt you are aware before the public and i only wait until my comments are finished to send you a copy of them from the author you will find that in my opinion one you have introduced regulations into the library which are vexatious and unnecessary and impede research by preventing literary men from consulting the books with facility and comfort two that the new catalogue is improperly delayed and that its plan is injudicious if not impracticable and therefore that the money spent on its compilation is wasted with respect to press marks my objection is as you cannot but know not to their being inserted in the catalogue to be used if a reader desires to identify a particular copy of a book but to your insisting as a sine qua non to the delivery of any book whatever no matter how well known it may be that the applicant shall refer to the catalogue and fill up five volumes literally including the press mark i say this is vexatious and unnecessary in one hundred out of one hundred and five cases the title itself written from memory ought to be as i repeat it it was in the time of your predecessors sufficient if a particular edition is wanted the applicant will not fail to specify it if he has a doubt as to the title or edition he will then refer to the catalogue but in my case when i had copied both the title and the press mark i could not obtain the book and you justify the neglect i entirely deny that your system causes a quicker delivery of books on the contrary i declare from experience that the delay is now much greater than it was before you introduced your scheme a reader is still sometimes told that a book is not in the library though he may have used it only a few days before perhaps you may not have forgotten the index to the dispatches of the duke of wellington which you insisted with characteristic gentleness was not in the library though i over and over again told you i had had it in my hands within a week i persisted and the book was brought to me in ten minutes after your vehement assurances that it was not in the museum so much for the working of your system you say the fault in these cases is the applicants for not complying with all your regulations and you coolly talk of their imputing the effect of their own ignorance or carelessness to the officers of the museum i answer that the officers of the museum have no right to impose regulations which are vexatious and unnecessary which give useless trouble and cause great loss of time the applicants may almost as reasonably be expected to copy the whole of the first and last pages of books as what you require and because an unimportant mistake is made as to the date and size of a book of which there is only one edition and no similar title in the english language the salaried officer of the institution refuses or rather justifies his subordinate in refusing the book and thinks it decorous and proper to taunt him with ignorance or carelessness there is nothing so attractive in this controversy as to induce me to bring others into it and if you do not choose to believe my assertion i cannot help it i have not presumed to doubt anything you have said nor to impute improper motives to your conduct but courtesy is a matter of feeling and i have no right to expect you to imitate me i must say again that the matters under discussion can only be settled by a higher authority than yours you have brought the subject before the trustees i have as i usually do on subjects which concern the public laid the facts before the public you can vindicate your proceedings either to the trustees or to the public i avow and maintain all i have and all i may yet say but i decidedly decline to continue this correspondence because i am sure it can lead to no desirable result 
and for the other reasons which i have assigned i consider the subject one of a public nature and regret to perceive that you are angry for until your last letter i had determined to avoid making any personal remark likely to displease you believe me etc i can have no sort of objection to your laying this and my last letter together with the communication which you will receive from me on monday next before the trustees if you see fit number eleven mr panisi to sir n h nicholas may twenty seventh eighteen forty six sir i am surprised to find that the expressions which displease you most in my letter of the twenty sixth instant are those which i transcribed verbatim from one which you volunteered to write to me in eighteen thirty seven and of which i enclosed a copy you then warmly approved of those very arrangements which you now so violently condemn i call upon you to publish the enclosed along with the observations which you are to send me on monday next in order that all unprejudiced and sincere persons may judge what reliance is to be placed on the opinions and assertions of a man endowed with so flexible a judgment and so treacherous a memory i am etc number twelve sir n h nicholas to mr Pennington torrington square twenty six may eighteen forty six sir your communication of this day induces me most reluctantly to add one more letter to our correspondence it is proper that i should advert to my letter of the twentieth of october eighteen thirty seven of which you have made so candid and gentlemanly and if i condescend to imitate your style i might say so characteristic a use the production of that letter gives me neither surprise nor concern i usually write and speak from the impression of the moment and must expect occasionally especially after an interval of nearly nine years to find some inconsistencies in my opinions in this case however the inconsistency is more apparent than real but be it great or small you are welcome to any use of you can make of it the facts as you well know were these in eighteen thirty seven it seems that i was not satisfied with the management of the reading-room as the time in obtaining printed books was greater than it had formerly been you succeeded to the department and introduced the rules which have in practice proved inconvenient but which were supposed to do much within the first few weeks after your appointment to remedy the evil it seems also that you made other improvements and that the changes elicited my praise experience has however proved that i was mistaken and i have long since seen my mistake so long as the apparent effect lasted and appeared to justify the apparent cause it was better to give ten minutes to the catalogue than to wait three not to say six times as long as i have often done of late for a book the additional trouble however remains without the advantage which alone justified its imposition it is really too much to oblige readers to waste their time over the catalogue and to revert to worse than the old delays so long as your plan worked well i approved of it for some years past it has worked ill and i have condemned it you wisely tried an experiment but you unwisely continued the plan though it has failed i have no reluctance to avow a change in my opinions whenever it has been produced by a change in the circumstances on which it was formed but i have no respect for mulish obstinacy or bigoted self-sufficiency you may be sure that if a convenient opportunity be afforded me for printing my letter to you of october eighteen thirty seven it shall after collation with the original be published but i will not separate it from this correspondence the english public would learn with astonishment the manner in which by a series of unmarked quotations a generous letter may be perverted for ungenerous purposes i am etc p s should you possess any letter from me commending the plan of the catalogue i should be very happy to add it to our recent correspondence n h n 
london printed by charles whittingham took's court eighteen forty six end of section twenty eight